Okay, let's start. Should sure. I start? Whenever you want to. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So before starting, I want to share with you all something. The woman that is talking to you is a trained mechanical engineer who chose her family and service to Allah's deen over a corporate career and a six-digit salary, of course. This I say to make it clear that I detest feminism. Both in my words, you can check my YouTube channel, and my actions. We're going to be talking about Muslim women and education. So there's some terms that need to be defined here. Who is a Muslim woman? What is education? And whether it's important for a Muslim woman to be educated or not. A Muslim woman is someone who has submitted herself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her priorities are clear. Serving her creator, following the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and being devoted to her family. What is education? Primarily understanding the Quran, hadith, fiqh, seerah, as much as we can, and also understanding the world around. Yeah, the hissing is gone. Can you hear me now? Now I can't hear you. Oh, you. Oh, oh, I'm oh. hearing. Yeah. I muted myself. Yes, you can do that. That uh, that helps. Thank you. So, Subhanallah, I must confess, in my entire life, I've never felt so small that I have to actually have to argue why education is important for Muslims, a community whose prophet emphatically uh, declared that seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim, male or female. Yeah. And he Islam, didn't restrict its scope by saying religious knowledge. This hadith along with numerous ayat became the primary motivation for the greatest intellectual revolution in history. And we all know that the golden age of Islam where men, Muslim men and women became great ulama, fuqaha, muhaddisun, muhaddisat, scientists, mathematicians, they changed the course of history quite literally. Even the most wild and Islamophobic Orientalists on surveying Muslim history were forced to concede how Muslims revolutionized the pursuit of education. And we all know that it was a Muslim woman who established the world's first degree awarding university, the University of Qairawiyin. So it all starts with the command of read. The Prophet ﷺ himself was a teacher, al-mu'allim, for both men and women. But he emphasized on the education of Muslim women dedicating an extra day for their education. The masjid, of course, was the hub for learning and Muslim women were regular attendees. Aisha, Umm Salama radiallahu anha, were hadith narrators and issued fatawa. Yes, Asma bint Abu Bakr, Umm Atiya, Umm Hani, Fatima bint Qais had extensive knowledge of hadith along with the other Sahabiyat who memorized large parts of the Quran. The invaluable fiqh opinions of Safiya, Hafsa, Umm Habiba, Juwairiya, Fatima, I can go on, could fill volumes. Now, did you know that between the 8th and the 15th century, there was such a rise of female scholarship in the Islamic world that it is unprecedented in human history. No civilization before Islam has witnessed anything of this magnitude. I'm talking about women, uh, female scholarship, an upsurge, unprecedented upsurge in female scholarship. Now, all of the great Imams, the four great Imams had female teachers. Imam Shafi was taught Hadith by Sayyidah Nafisa, the great scholar from Medina. Umm Darda, the wife of Abu Darda, the Sahabi, was a prominent jurist in the 7th century Damascus. It said that she would sit with male scholars in the mosque and have debates with them on fiqh. She would even lecture in the men's section, teaching them hadith and fiqh. Her students included the caliph, Ab Abdul Malik bin Marwan, and we still use her fatwa, by the way, uh, that allows men and women to pray in the same position in tashahud. In fact, women teaching in masajid was a norm back then. 
Here, people like Daniel uh, would like wi uh, for women to be banned from the masjid. Back in the day, someone like Fatima al-Batahiniya, an expert in Sahih al-Bukhari, was invited. Hear me properly, please. Was invited by the people of Medina to deliver a dars on Bukhari. Guess where she was asked to give the dars to a mixed gathering of Muslim men and women in Masjid al-Nabawi. Which part of Masjid Nabawi, you would ask me, the holiest, right next to the Prophet's grave? Women taught mixed gatherings in Masjid al-Haram, inside the Hatim, the semicircular area, and even Masjid al-Aqsa. Did you know that the most accurate copy of Sahih al-Bukhari was written by a female scholar, Karima bint Marwazia? And it wasn't just religious scholarship we're talking about. Muslim women became experts in geography, astronomy, mathematics, medicine. Names like Lubna Cordoba, uh, Maryam Astrolabia, Sutaita al-Mahmali, all of that. The Sahabia who were experts in medicine, we know Aslamia, Um Mata'a, Um Kabsha, Hamna, Bint Jahash, Mu'atha, Ama'ima, I can go on and on and on. Now, a woman, Rufaida Aslamia, had a tent next to the Prophet's mosque where she would treat the wounded and conduct surgery. Now, many historians, including George Sarton, says that the mobile hospital of the early Muslims quickly evolved into Islamic hospitals called Bimaristans and inspired the Europeans who came as crusaders to open the same in Europe. A Muslim woman's mobile tent is behind the modern healthcare system. So many Sahabiyat also ran businesses, cottage industries like manufacture and design of fabric, leather tanning, kaula, malika, thakafiya, bint fakhriya, owned businesses in perfume, whereas Sauda op operated a leather tanning factory. And we all know about Khadija radiallahu anha who supported the Prophet financially as well as emotionally. This is our history, brothers and sisters. This is our heritage. This is mentioned in our classical books like Khatib al-Baghdadi, Tawakat ibn Sa'ad, Fihrist of ibn Nadim, Tariq of ibn Asakir. This is Islam. Those people lie who say female scholarship and women in the work space was an exception. They lie. No, this was the norm. Then came the colonialists. Now, they toppled everything, replaced our institutions with theirs, installed a European paradigm in the Muslim world that had its values eroded over time. We need to understand in what context did feminism emerge. Women in medieval European society up until the 18th and the 19th century, just two centuries back, were treated literally like dirt. To give you an example, a European woman in the 19th century couldn't even enter the universities of London, Austria, France, let alone being allowed to teach or study in the universities. Now, this is in sharp contrast with Muslim women who were centuries ahead teaching and studying in the most prestigious places in the Islamic world. The idea of women being in the workforce serving the Muslim Ummah was so integral to Islam as it can be best seen when Umar radiallahu an appointed a woman, Shifa bint Abdullah, the chief supervisor of the Medina market. Brothers and sisters, keep in mind this is no ordinary market. This is the economic hub of an emerging superpower that defeated the Persian and Roman empires. Keep all of this in mind. Keeping all of this in mind, we see that feminism rose as a reaction to how European women were discriminated against. So it's a Western construct, not applicable really to Islam. The two most important events in European history, the scientific revolution and the subsequent industrial revolution, have literally zero participation of women. Basically, European history has no women. And, but if you compare that, Islam is completely different. That was Europe. This is Islam. Muslim women were central to the great intellectual period between the 7th and the 18th century. Now, I want to draw your attention to something very sinister that the colonialists created. They created a smokescreen that literally cut the Muslim world off from its tradition. With coining words like modern, they wanted to convince the world that only the Western civilization was advanced and every other civilization was dumped in pr the pre-modern category. They promoted ideas like there was no science before the white man brought the scientific revolution. And similarly, they pushed the idea there was no woman's empowerment 
before the Western feminist movement. This was a colonialist narrative. Daniel, my brother here, is the perfect example of someone who's deeply affected by this colonialist psychological conditioning. He just cannot get himself to accept that there was a civilization where women were in the workforce, others who were full-time teachers and students, along with being great mothers and wives. Why? Because he cannot see beyond the white man's lens. The colonialist smoke screen. He's deeply disadvantaged because of his ignorance of the Islamic tradition and his inability to access the tradition in the Arabic language. All he does is keep regurgitating two or three hadiths over and over again, not very different from how an Islamophobe cherry picks ayah to malign Islam. We need to remind our brother here lovingly that Islam is not just three hadiths. There, that is why no matter how much I would try to convince him on Facebook, he'll still... You're over time. Okay, give me a second, just one last line. He'll still call... Like a minute over time. Yeah. He'll still call our heritage a feminist projection. Daniel, this is our history documented by our historians, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Saad, Ibn Nadim. The truth is that civilizations are not the same. We had science in the Muslim world for 1,000 years. We didn't become atheists, but Europe did. So should we turn our backs on science just because Europe couldn't handle it? Feminism broke the family unit, yes. But not all cultures that empower women take the same trajectory. Islamic history is a testament to that. And I belong to that great Islamic tradition. Jazakallah khair. Okay, so about a minute and a half over time. Thank you. You can take the extra time. Okay. Let me just reset the clock. Okay, now I'll deliver my opening statement, inshallah, starting time. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatullah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, I was blessed to marry my wife 13 years ago. We got married in college at Harvard. After the marriage, we sat down for one of our first meals together. At that point, we didn't really know much about each other. So we were just talking. And at one point in the conversation, out of the blue, I told her, you know what? I don't believe in women's education. She kind of looked shocked back at me, stunned like I was from a different planet. Many of you watching this are probably just as confused as my wife was that night. But after I explained to her exactly why I don't believe in women's education and my Islamic reasons for this, she came to fully agree with me. I hope the same will be the case with everyone listening today. My position in this debate is simple. Pursuing education empowers women, but Islam is against empowering women. I know this sounds shocking to some, but hear me out. What I mean by empowerment is increasing social status and power through education or career. Islam does not encourage women to gain power in this way. In fact, Islam is against it. You won't find anywhere in the Quran, in the Sunnah, or the scholarly tradition where women are encouraged to gain power and status in society. Does this mean that there weren't rich or powerful women in Muslim society? Of course, there have been many such women, but they had power by means of marriage or through family ties or through inheritance. And no matter how powerful these women were, they were still under the authority of their male family members or male political authorities. But when we talk about women's education today, we have to realize what women's education means. When feminists push women's education, what they want is for women to gain power so they can be equal to men. Feminists want women to gain power in the family so that they can be equal to their husbands. Feminists want women to gain power in society so that women can be equal to men in becoming presidents and prime ministers. That is the purpose of pushing women's education. It is about gaining power and gender equality. But again, this is discouraged by Islam. Islam has a social blueprint that requires male authority over women on every level of human society. When it comes to family, when it comes to politics, when it comes to religious leadership, 
Women's empowerment through education is completely contrary to this. Now, Islam has no problem with women studying their religion for the purpose of teaching their children or other women or out of personal interest. In fact, there's nothing better than women studying deen for the specific purpose of raising strong Muslim children. But this type of education is very domestic and it has nothing to do with gaining power or creating equal religious authority between men and women. But feminists have weaponized studying religion. They have weaponized this use of the word empowerment, which you cannot find anywhere in the Quran, Sunnah, or scholarly tradition. It is purely a feminist invention. The feminist sheikhs push women to study religion so that these women can sit on masjid boards equally with men and can serve on fatwa councils equally with men and become community leaders and influencers equally with men. It may sound paradoxical, but by studying deen for these empowerment purposes, they are actually acting contrary to deen. So this is the type of women's education I oppose, whether it is secular or religious, whether it is in a college or a seminary. I know what many of you might be thinking. Isn't empowering women a good thing? Isn't it shameful to claim that Islam is against empowering women through education? Not at all. We live in unprecedented times where women have more wealth, more education, more power than they have at any point, other point in human history. But look around. Look at the grave consequences of this. According to the UN, women have made massive strides in education. In some regions, women now are spending double or triple the amount of time pursuing education as they were 50 years ago. In the Middle East and, Africa, and North Africa, 50 years ago, women spent on average five years in school. Now they spend about 13 years on average. In South Asia, 50 years ago, women spent on average four years in school. Now they spend about 12. So it's tripled. Not only are women spending much more time in school than ever before, they have also overtaken men in total schooling time globally. This is due to the fact that in most countries, there are more women in college than men. In 2021, US college students were about 60% women. When we look at women in science fields, the percentages are also going up. Nowhere is the percentage of women studying science higher than in countries like Algeria, Tunisia, Turkey, Albania, and the UAE. In all these Muslim countries, women in science-related fields is over 35%, sometimes up to 40%. In comparison, in the US, only about 25% of science students are women. So by all measures, women in general and Muslim women in particular are making huge strides in education. This is great news, right? Having more and more educated and empowered women can only mean good things for society as a whole, right? But this is not what we see. Instead, we see society collapsing. Most immediately, we can look at statistics regarding women's happiness levels, Sociologist Betsy Stevenson wrote a landmark paper, paper titled The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness. The paradox is that women are more educated, more powerful, more wealthy than ever before, yet their happiness has steadily declined. The author notes that these results are global and pervasive across all demographics. What we're also seeing is the death of marriage and family. According to Pew, in a few short years, 75% of millennials will never be married. This will be an all-time low. Academics like Manveer Singh say, quote, marriage as pr practice in every society is in steep decline globally, end quote. Now, I can give you all kinds of stats about how fertility rates are plummeting, how divorce rates are rising, how zina is through the roof, how this is leading to millions of abortions every year. Now, I'm not blaming all this on women's education exclusively, by the way, but women's empowerment through education plays a major part in every single one of these trends. 
The causal link is clear when we consider certain basic, undeniable facts about human biology and psychology. Women pursuing education means they have to delay marriage. Delaying marriage means women get married when they're older, meaning they have fewer children or no children. And once women are educated, they want to pursue careers, which means that even if they do have one or two children, they have to abandon those children for their empowering careers. Delaying marriage also results in women having more sexual partners prior to marriage. As research shows, the more sexual partners women have prior to marriage, the weaker their marital bonds and the more likely their marriages will fail. Furthermore, we have to factor in hypergamy. What hypergamy means is that women prefer to marry males who are higher than them in social status. The problem is, as women are empowered and rise in their social status, that means the pool of men they can marry decreases. If you're a successful woman with a PhD, you want to marry a man who is even more successful than you. This means there's a vanishingly small pool of men who will fit your criteria as you rise the ranks. As a result, many women simply will never get married. And most of those who do get married have to marry someone of lower social status than they would prefer. And because women are hypergamous, they will consciously or subconsciously feel less attracted to these lower status husbands. And women who are less attracted to their husbands are more likely to cheat and eventually divorce. And the Muslim world is not spared from this. Women's education is being heavily pushed in the Muslim world, and in some countries like Morocco, divorce has increased by over 600% in the last 15 years. Today in the UAE, where women's education is soaring, 62% of marriages end in divorce within just the first four years, according to government statistics. So women's education is directly tied to the modern collapse of marriage and family. But the problem with women's education actually goes much deeper. Again, what are the consequences of empowering women so that they not only occupy, but dominate academia, workplaces, media, government? Richard Hanania, a public intellectual, recently published a fascinating paper titled Women's Tears Win in the Marketplace of Ideas. Many others have written about the feminization of the public sphere. The deeper problem they point to is that men and women operate according to different moral psychologies. Studies show that compared to men, women, women's morality highly emphasizes care and empathy. This makes women's moral psychologies ideal for the domestic and family sphere. In contrast, men tend to emphasize justice, which makes their psychologies well-suited for leadership and authority. The priority that women place on care and empathy, while very beneficial for the family context, creates problems in the public sphere. It involves, this is because the public sphere requires justice. It requires holding people accountable. It involves being judgmental and at times being harsh regardless of people's feelings. Feminizing major social institutions by empowering women through education thus has a direct negative impact on society. When we look at the damage that women's empowerment is doing to the world, we should say Alhamdulillah for Islam. Allah says in Surah An-Nisa verse 34, al -nisa. Men are in charge of women. The Prophet وسلم, said in a well-known hadith, a people will not succeed who are commanded by a woman. When we look at Islamic history, we see that 100% of the madhahib were founded by men. 100% of the major tafsirs were written by men. 100% of the sahih hadith collections were collected by men. And for all of Muslim history, no one had a problem with any of this. In fact, we should understand this male dominance as the mark of a healthy civilization, an exemplary civilization. We need to appreciate the profound wisdom of Islam, the genius of Islam. We need to revive the wisdom and this wisdom and offer it as a cure 
for this sick and confused world rather than play this silly game of feminist empowerment. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to go into my... Just a minute. Let me time myself. Okay, so we are going to do five-minute responses. Yes. I'm going to start. Now, I'm going to call this section Daniel's Delusions. Daniel, in numerous articles and videos, perils of educating our daughters, Muslim feminism, the modern form of burying our daughters, should and also should Muslim women work, etc., he argues against female education. Clearly, women who go to college will disproportionately suffer from moral degeneration associated with the rise in liberalism and feminism. Uh, while there is no denying that liberalism, feminism, is damaging traditional social structures, I'm not denying that. But Daniel, all throughout his arguments, uses U.S. studies, stats, and then very conveniently goes on to apply that to the wide Muslim ummah. The question in the very beginning that we need to ask Daniel is that the Muslim ummah is two billion strong, mashallah, with roughly half of them being women. So one billion Muslim women we're talking about. So when you keep saying in all your lectures, feminism is the status quo, are you prepared to prove to us that a large chunk of these one billion uh, Muslim women who say the Shahada, m many of them, most of them, are feminists? When you write your articles like The Perils of Educating Our Daughters or Muslim Feminism, Modern Form, whatever, uh, the question is, who are these Muslim women? Because you use this general statement, the Muslim women. Who are these uh, Muslim women who need to be saved from feminism? Now, I want to show uh, my screen. Uh, I mean, share my screen, please. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. There you go. Yeah, I can. I can't do that. Hold on. Your time is still running. I uh, know uh, you'll have to stop, please, because I was I wanted to share my screen. I'm sorry, but uh, I can't do that for some re reason. Have you uh, disabled that? No, you. It hasn't changed. It's the same screen that you had before. Oh. It's the same uh, slide that you had in the intro, yeah. and I left it up the whole time. Uh, there you go. Now, can you see my screen? No. Hello? Uh, that you had before. Yes, now. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, can we... I mean, uh, that was like one minute? Okay, I'm going to start from here. So, we no, talk it was about... two minutes. Let's okay. go. So, we're talking about who are these Muslim women? So, you... I want to ask you this question because are you the question is who are these muslim women who need to be saved from feminism are you talking about the yeah so these are the u.s stats he always uses u.s is a non-muslim country are you talking about the nigerian muslim woman working in potato fields trying to make ends meet or are you talking talking about the indonesian muslim woman who prays all her salawat in the factory working for less than a dollar just because the husband's income is not enough as the country has been hit by the falling currency value or are you talking about the syrian muslim woman who saw her husband father brother all killed and now fence for herself by working in a store in Turkey, coping as a refugee, or are you talking about an Uyghur Muslim woman who saved enough money to get a technical degree and work in a Chinese factory? Now, Daniel, it so happens that the Muslim Ummah is not homogenous. According to Pew Research, 10 of uh, the largest Muslim countries that include Indonesia, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan are either stuck in a continuous cycle of war, violence and civil unrest on the other side, along with facing the worst economic crisis in history. All that these wom uh, uh, women want is to survive. 
that's it. For them, their degree or their work is not a result of some feminist brainwashing, empowerment, taking over the world uh, and all of that. It's just a tool for their survival. This is one of the many, many problems with Daniel's ideology that he takes a specific case of women affected by feminism. Yes. And then applies it to a two billion strong Muslim ummah, thereby releasing his very generic verdicts like should Muslim women work, should Muslim women get degrees, etc. Yes, your wife, Um Khalid, thank God, found it appropriate to mention their case when she says in timestamp 5643 of should Muslim women work that some women, they have no choice but to work due to the circumstances. Thank God, she said that I'm very grateful. Some women, some women, we're talking about a 2 billion population, 70% of which lives in war-torn areas. Okay, war-torn areas. Let me remind you, working doesn't just mean making PowerPoints and walking in corporate corridors. Even washing someone's dishes, sewing someone's clothes, cleaning someone's house comes under work. And this is the situation of a huge population of the Muslim Ummah, be it in Yemen, in Somalia, in Kashmir, in Bangladesh. Your ideology is disturbingly divorced from reality, Daniel. You are deluded. And uh, you. no, if I have some time, so it's like, you know, it's like, no, it's, you don't have time. It's okay. five minutes. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, so let me just reset this. Yeah. So your entire presentation is a hoax. Basically you cite all kinds of half truths or complete falsehoods. I want to describe some of that from your intro. Uh, but let me first actually talk about what you just pointed out, like women working in sweatshops, it, what does that have to do with education? Like you're talking about work, women working, that's a whole separate topic. We can debate that. You're citing women working in sweatshops in worn, torn countries <laughs> as some kind of message of empowerment and, and something good for women, like Uyghur women working on uh, Western clothes or in, on Nikes in the sweatshop. That's very bizarre that you would point to that. So I want to, um, note that you didn't respond to my points about how within the Quran, within the Sunnah, within the scholarly tradition, we see no claim that women should be empowered, let alone go and pursue empowerment and social um, advancement through education. Nowhere do we find that. All you've done is cite and cherry pick examples of women uh, and say that this somehow supports women's empowerment. This is a hoax. This is this is not actually the case. And many of your examples are completely misleading. Uh, let me go through some of these uh, that I wrote down for you. <clears throat> okay, for example, you mentioned Suteita al Muhammadi. You mentioned. Fatima Al-Fihri established the world's first university. Okay, she established it, no problem. Are, were women attending this first university? No, it was all men. It was all male madrasa. And there's absolutely no evidence. First of all, there's no evidence historically it's questioned whether she actually founded Qarawi'in. That's a historical debate. And second, there's no evidence that she or anyone other female were studying at that university or teaching other men. You mentioned people like Fatima al Baghdadiya and saying that she would lecture in front of the masjid, in front of men. This, there is no historical data from this. This is from Akram Nedwi. Akram Nedwi is the one who puts forward these ridiculous claims, and they have been completely refuted. Okay, when you actually look at the reference in Ibn Kathir and elsewhere, it does not mention Fatima al baghdadiya lecturing men from the pulpit. Yes, women would teach other women, and women would sometimes transmit a hadith to an individual man behind a, a screen, but there is no historical evidence of a woman going in front of men on the mimbar and giving a lecture in, in plain view of men. There's no historical evidence of this. And Akram Nadwi's Evidences have been shown to be fraudulent. He misquotes them. So everything that you're citing is from that. Um, let's see. And, and the proof of this, like a very strong proof of this, what Akram Nadwi ignores and what you ignore is the fiqh. Because the fiqh in all madahib, in all four schools, 
say that uh, this would be um, fitna for a woman to show her face and to stand in front of men and lecture. This is impermissible, especially for young women. For young women, women who are showing their face made up like these modern sheikhas who go to the masjid and give lectures with makeup and the tightest, most you know, form-fitting clothes. This is something that all madhahib have prohibited. And even the example of the sahabiyat that you gave of going to the masjid, this again, this is not the case. They would go to the masjid for salah, for fajr and isha. So when you talk about Umm Salama, for example, these were older, or Atika, radiallahu anhum, uh, anha. These were older Sahabiyat, and they were going to the masjid completely veiled in black, including their face, and they would go for Fajr and Isha Salah at night. When it's pitch black, there's no electricity, there's no lighting, so they cannot be seen. This is completely different from the situation that uh, we have today with these feminists going to the masjid and um, in, in their Sunday best or their Friday best for showing off. Fiqh, if we actually look at the fiqh, this is completely prohibited. Also, a big example, when you mention Shifa bint Abdullah and you say that she's an economist or like a he health and economy minister, do you know what she really was when you actually go to the sources? She was in charge of hisba for women. Do you know what hisba means? That means she had a whip, and if women were not covered properly, she would whip them. <laughs> she was in charge of enjoining good and for forbidding evil. That's hispa. It's not an economic minister, okay? There's no, show me the Arabic where it says uh, economic minister. In fact, I have the Arabic right here in front of me. I can read it for you. So she was... Okay, you're over time. Okay. Yeah. I'll stop there. You go ahead. Five minutes. Okay. So, I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about his statistics fraud again. No, don't start. Hold on, hold on. Let me share my screen first. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't no start right now. Let me share this. And there you go. Yeah. Okay. Now you can start. So uh, just a little bit of his statistics fraud. You have to understand what I'm trying to do is I'm going to show you Daniel doesn't even know Islam and neither does he know feminism. The, it's like, you know, the kind of statistics that he uses to basically create this sort of paranoia uh, around feminism. Again, I'm not saying it's uh, not a problem. Obviously, it is a problem. But you have to be honest. He's not honest. So... It's like prescribing insulin injections to the entire world just because diabetes is an epidemic in the U.S. Now, you, feminism essentially is the epicenter of feminism is the U.S. How many Muslims are there in the U.S.? So it's like I want to make a study on, let's say, South Korea. Will I take statistics from Ethiopia? That would be crazy, mad. But that's what Daniel does all the time. You can see it. I've shown you most of his, uh, all of his statistics are from the U.S. He talks, he wants to talk about Muslims, but he takes statistics of a non-Muslim country like the U.S. How many Muslims, again, live in the U.S.? Just 0.2% of the world's Muslims, I'm talking about Muslim women, live in North America. And the number of women would, younger women who could be affected by feminism would even be less. That is 0.05% Muslim women. And obviously, we cannot call all American Muslim women feminists, including his wife. No. So his statistics are all messed up. That's what I want to say. And if you, your statistics are wrong, what argument, what uh, weight does your argument uh, hold? Now, I want to deconstruct his argument most of the time, and he mentioned it right now. So he says that women's education, uh, what, the terribly wrong thing is that, firstly, from my side, I want to tell you that there is no ayat, there is no hadith that support his cause. Literally, there is nothing in the Islamic tradition that says that a woman has to be kept away from education. Okay, so I'm going to say, Whatever he says is not Islamically justified. It's not rationally justified. And lastly, it has no statistical basis. Daniel has made it very clear in his articles 
that modern education is intimately linked with feminist brainwashing of Muslim women. Okay, sure. So he offers four broad uh, arguments to bolster his ideology. Number one, his favorite one, the fitna argument. Let's call it the fitna argument. He says there's fitna in universities. Okay, the correct view according to Islam is that we are in Akhiru Zaman. The Prophet said there will not be a house in which fitna will not enter. Like raindrops, fitna will e reach each and every house. Sahih Bukhari 7060. Uh, fitna is everywhere. So long as you have a phone, you have an internet connection, relatives, neighbors, you are prone to fitna. We are living like Ashab al Kahf. It's not just in the universities, it's on your social media. Something which Daniel is so fond of. You open Yahoo Mail and the ad on the site is fitna. So, what are the basis of, for him drawing this causal connection that the university degree equals fitna? None other than his delusions. They could be various reasons for a youth going astray. Social media, bad company, bad parenting. In fact, most ex-Muslims, Ayan, Hirsi Ali, Taslima Nasreen, and all of these, they say unanimously that it was a negative experience of Islam in their early years that made them choose atheism. You want Muslim uh, children to be homeschooled? Fine, but how can a woman who isn't sufficiently educated educate her sh children. She doesn't know what's happening in the world. She doesn't know if, where, uh, what a fitna evolution or science poses to one's faith. How can that make sense? Now, what's striking is that he singles out Muslim women and says that they will be affected by feminism. And he advises Muslim dads not to educate their daughters. The question that we all need to ask Daniel is that are Muslim men immune to this fitna? What about drug use? What about pro pornography, apostasy? Do these affect only women? Daniel proved to us that women are more likely to leave religion than men. Pew did a global survey of adults aged 20 and over in more than 192 countries in 2015 reported that women were more likely to be religiously affiliated than men across most religious groups and with an even split between Muslim men and women and men significantly outnumbering women. Men are going out of religion, Muslim men, when it came to not affiliating themselves with any other religion whatsoever. So a lot of studies point out the negative impact of social media on traditional re religious values. Are you advocating that women should not use social media, Daniel? Maybe that would take away a large chunk of your income, wouldn't it? Okay, <laughs> so let me just start my own time and take this off. Okay. All right, so you keep saying that all my stats are from the US. <laughs> That's not true. I cited the UN global stats. I tried it Manveer Singh, who specifically says he's talking about global trends. I said, cited Betsy Stevenson, who is talking about uh, global trends as well across all demographics. Everything that I cited was global. I talked about the UAE. I talked about uh, Turkey. I talked about Albania. I talked about uh, all of these Muslim countries. I don't know why you straw man me and say that this is, I'm only taking stats from the United States. Uh, as for the fitna argument, where did I make this argument in my opening statement? Are you debating me or, or who are you debating? Um, we can talk about fitna in the university. We can talk about how uh, this kind of fitna in the university, not only with the, the environment of secular university. I mean, I'm surprised that you're trying to defend secular university and Muslim women going to these kinds of universities. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about the universities in India, in Pakistan, in Turkey, in Egypt. All of these universities that take on a Western model, the whole point of the university is to liberalize and secularize the Muslim world. And I'm shocked that you would uh, defend that. I thought I had a, like a, um, like a di more difficult debate topic, but you want to defend even the secular universities where so many Muslim men and women are losing their faith. It's, it's a, even a, it's a bigger tragedy for women because there is no real reason for women to go to university. That's the That was the whole point of my uh, opening statement. And there's in Islam, Islamically, there is no daruri reason. And this is in every fatwa that you find. 
there is no daruri reason, the necessity for women to go to college, to go to these universities, especially when they're a mixed environment, when it's a secular environment, when they're teaching atheism through many of these courses and people, Muslims are losing their faith then there is no daruri reason for men there is because they have to they have all the financial obligations but for women they don't have they have no financial obligations in islam islam provides for women in all cases if they're married or they're not married and i'm not saying that this is a great situation that we're living in with the modern world unfortunately it's a terrible situation and a lot of muslim women have to make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise so i'm not here to judge muslim women who go to the university but i'm trying to explain islam's stance and what in an ideal world we should want what should be our ideal what should we strive for if we have this feminist model that is just blinding us and we're just parroting the West and trying to cook up some kind of confusing Islamic argument from Akram Nadwi to just have Muslim women go to the university, then this is going to lead to our failure. It is leading to our failure. And the stats that I uh, cited from all over the world, all over the Muslim world, prove that. Um, yeah, you're done. You're done. No, no, it's not done. I only spoke three and a half minutes. So Prophet, one of the examples that you mentioned that I find hilarious is that you said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dedicated one day for of a week in teaching women, right? So if this is equal access to education, shouldn't have been half of the week dedicated? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dedicated half of the week to men and half of it to women? No, he only dedicated one out of seven days. This is a great proof from you that there is not equal access to education, even when we look at the example of the Prophet ﷺ. Or if we want to even go uh, beyond that, even the first, who, what is the first example of a, of a human being learning? It is when Allah taught Adam salam, our father, the names. Allah taught Adam السلام, the names. He did not teach a woman alongside of him, for example, or the angel Jibreel السلام, bringing revelation. Jibreel السلام, brought revelation to the Prophet. السلام. He didn't say, okay, here's the message for the Prophet. السلام. I also need a female representative so we have equal access to education. That wasn't the case. It was not equal access to education. So these are the kinds of uh, points that you want to avoid and you want to make ridiculous arguments like all of my statistics are coming from the United States That is blatantly false. And when you say that madrasa students were half and half women and men in history and all of these uh, Jamiat and so forth were half and half or had a lot of women where are the academic citations to prove that because this should be a historical fact that can be easily accessed all you've cited are just what you've heard from i don't know who there is no academic show me an academic citation for this okay thank you uh i'll share my screen first and Here we go. Okay, this one. Firstly, I must I must commend you for your audacity. Seriously, Daniel, you have some amount of audacity. Uh, Dr. Akram Nadwi is of the few people today living today in our world who has the shortest chain, the highest chain. It's called in Sahih al-Bukhari. There are only 14 people between him and Sahih al-Bukhari. And you, without an education in Islam, without going to any Islamic university, without having any ijazas, without even memorizing the Quran or being a Hafiz, without even knowing Arabic, you have the audacity to say that he is deviant. Wow, that's brilliant. Okay, by the way, the Muslim Sahabiyat, they were coming to the masjid regularly like the men. Yes, and then there was an extra day given to them. So that's when they have an extra time and e 
not, it's not equal access because they have more access. It's like saying that. So I've called this argument that you always make, like men have to go uh, to, uh, the uh, to the university. I call it the breadwinner argument. So another one of your favorite arguments is that men need to seek education because they are breadwinners. Now, brothers and sisters, listen very carefully. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in the Quran or Sunnah that says that a ma Muslim man must put his deen, his akhirah at stake just to feed his family. In fact, the Quran warns us about this behavior in uh, um, Surah 3, 14. Uh, it is better for a Muslim man to clean cars, sell vegetables, or work in kebab shops than go to universities if he feels that his akhira is in danger. The Quran destroys your argument completely. Then you'll have to concede that, yes, let's not uh, ask the Muslim men also to go to universities. So basically, you want the Muslim ummah to be so poor and so dependent and so literally like at the bottom of the pyramid. That's what you're saying. And again, he makes this Another argument of his is this marriage equals Jannah argument. So he talked about in the first, uh, when he was uh, giving his opening statement, that Muslim women who go to university, somehow in his mind, he's made this idea that they're going to be late for marriage and then uh, they're not going to get married or it's going to be very difficult. He doesn't know how the Eastern world works. Many times women are married even before going to university. And if you notice, Daniel never provides a hadith or an ayat to support his arguments against Muslim wi uh, women's education or work. Never, because there are no ayat or hadith that prevent a Muslim woman from being, uh, from being educated or even working for that matter. All he does is take the hadith, if a wo Muslim woman prays, fasts, obeys her husband and all that is right, then she will go to Jannah. All the ulama are of the opinion that this is not unconditional obedience we're talking about. Anyways, that's a different subject. And the obedience has to be only in that which is halal. I'm talking about the obedience to the husband. Uh, so we love this hadith. No Muslim woman would have a problem with this. I love this hadith. Where, but where does it say that an educated, empowered, let's use the word empowered woman, will not be a good wife or a good mother? We have 1400 years of Muslim history where Muslim women were full-time scholars, doctors, scientists, mathematicians. It's history. I mean, Ibn Kathir is not the only book. We are a tradition that turned the river Tigris black when the Mongols attacked. That's how many books we had back then, 1200 years back. What are you talking about? So all of them. All of these women that I've mentioned, they all have the kunya um. Why? They were wives and they were mothers. Your arguments are just they're statistically wrong. They have no basis in Islam and they just don't make sense. Your favorite argument, I want to go to that maybe in the next section. Okay, if I stop here, I have still some time. You can take over and maybe address the points that I did and then maybe I'll go over my argument inshallah so i stopped one uh, minute before so i can take this later okay first of all you lie against me repeatedly all of these uh in many posts you have lied against me and saying that i have some affiliation with isis this is a defamatory claim you're endangering me you're endangering my family i mean this might be funny to you you might think that it's a joke but you're actually threatening my life when you uh make these kinds of accusations against me you say that i have no credentials i haven't studied islam that i don't understand arabic these are all lies i have studied with many scholars i have gone through many mutun with ulama i have studied fiqh i have studied tafsir i've studied hadith I'm a student of knowledge, you know, I don't claim to be a scholar, but to say that I have not studied at all, and you haven't even asked me. So usually if you want to make a claim about someone and you want to make an accusation against them, then you should actually verify this. If you do not do that and you just make a claim without knowledge, this is slander. You have not asked me, have you? This is the first time we're speaking. You have not asked me about any of my study or my credentials. So you have literally slandered me and you continue to do this without shame. Um, again, you have given no citation for this claim that there was this overwhelming presence of women in Madaris 
You've given no citation for that. In fact, when we look at academic citations, there is no evidence of this. There are there is there might be evidence of individual women who come from wealthy backgrounds. We can find individual examples who of women who have studied with their scholarly fathers. That's the evidence that we have. But this claim that this, there's a sociological reality of all women are equally going to the madrasa, that doesn't exist. And you haven't, you can you know, nod your head, but you haven't actually cited anything. When we actually look at the tabaqat literature, when we look at the, you know, the, the uh, isnad of hadith, we see that's overwhelmingly men, 90, at least 98% men. So where is the equal access? This is the question that you continue to avoid. Because look, you are making a very significant claim. You're saying that Islam provides equal access to education for men and women, and this is demonstrated by our history. You are not showing that history. If there were equal access to education, explain this. Why are none of the major tafsir works authored by women? Why are none of the major fiqh works authored by women? Why is there not a single madhab that comes from a woman. There's no mujtahid, female mujtahid. Where is the you know, major hadith collection that is collected by a woman? If there were equal access to education, as you claim, then w there should be at least one right in 1400 years, but we don't see it and you're not providing an explanation. My explanation is that women were not given equal access to education. Women had responsibilities of raising a family, which is extremely important. It's extremely important. It's extremely valuable to raise children, to be good wives, to support the ummah in that way, not to go and study, to, because studying Islam historically was a very physically difficult task. It required um, actually uh, traveling long distances, which women cannot do without a male guardian. It required uh, physically, you have to be willing to not eat maybe for days, be hungry. Look at the biographies of the great scholars. It wasn't like some air conditioned college where you go sit and listen to a lecture all day. This is why it, it was physically burdens and physically difficult for women to actually attain that level of scholarly knowledge. And there are many other factors that limited women's access to education, sociologically, phys uh, physiologically, physically. So this is the explanation why we don't see major tafsir or hadith collections or, or that kind of level of scholarship from women. I have the explanation. You are not able to provide that explanation. And it, it seems like you don't want to do that. Um, again, like uh, hadith. You wanted hadith. Let me give you some hadith. Um, hadith is the sirah. Hadith is when we look at the example, all of the examples I've given you of how Muslim women conducted themselves. They were not mixing with men. Or do you not agree that Islam prohibits ikhtilat? Islam prohibits ikhtilat means the mixing of men and women. Yes, there can be limited circumstances where a woman is teaching behind a screen where she is not visible to men or to a man. But this is something that's rare. This is not something that was common, and it's not proven in the, in the first three generations. It's not proven by the Sahaba or the Sahabiyat. So you, you really don't have anything except cherry-picked examples, which I didn't deny. There are these powerful women in history, but their power is from inheritance. It's from wealth. It's from uh, being married to, to a scholar. It wasn't because they went to the university and studied engineering and got their PhD. Like, this is not the reality. Like, you're, you're just giving us a kind of uh, myth that doesn't exist. You're projecting a feminist myth of mythos onto, his, onto the historical past. Done? Yes, yep. thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna hold on. Don't start. I have one extra minute. Um, 
So uh, you talked about uh, men and women and the segregation. Uh, I must remind you that we come from a tradition when the Prophet and the early Muslims, they actually prayed in the same space without any curtain, without any sort of uh, separate accommodation for women. That's our best uh, era and our best time. So that has to be kept in mind. So when we talk about, obviously, there would be uh, hijab there would be the ethics so i'm not denying that by the way you talk about all of the why are they no masa you know madahib and all of that i mean equal access doesn't mean who gets famous i mean uh, they weren't doing it for money or for fame or this it doesn't mean that and on top of that i mentioned few uh, cases where karima bint marwazia the sahih bukhari that you have in your house and i have here the uh, most accurate copy is that of a woman. That is, uh, and then uh, you talked about m uh, women traveling. There are actually many, many accounts of how women travel. There was one uh, who is notable for this, Fatima bin Saad al Qaeda, who actually traveled from China till North Africa just to seek education. And then she married a man 14 years younger than her and settled in Egypt. Obviously, she would have traveled with her mahram, with her father, because her father was very uh, keen on that. But I want to go into something very interesting. I, I love this argument of yours, which, is, which I call the fertility argument. Okay, so Daniel likes to argue against, and you did refer to it, that Muslim women getting an education uh, because, you know, uh, the problem with education is because those years spent getting a degree are her prime time fertility years, right? So once she finishes her degrees, it would be too late, meaning less children. So basically, he relates higher education in females to lowering of the fertility rate. I cannot tell you how Hindu, Hindu, uh, this this idol-worshipping Hindu, this argument is. Because in traditional Hindu societies, the worth of a woman is just her womb. That is used to perpetuate a family's lineage. Uh, she has literally no value beyond that whatsoever. This is completely un-Islamic. But let's see how Daniel's view gets completely destroyed by the statistics on the ground. According to UN research, the countries with the lowest illiteracy rate, that is the highest literacy rate, happen to be in Central Asia along with Europe. Okay, let's not take Europe. Central Asia. Azerbaijan uh, being the second most educated country in the world, Iran, Kuwait, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, 97% literacy rate. We're talking about Turkey, Iran, Egypt, scientific publications. You mentioned that. Yes, Indonesia, the largest Muslim majority country, 99% youth literacy rate. What's more, the gender gap is... Hold on. The gender gap in education in sub uh, Saharan Africa is also narrowing. More females are getting educated. Now, here's something that completely destroys Daniel's argument. The Muslim world has the highest. The hi Let me repeat that. The highest birth rate as compared to any community in the world. All of these regions have the biggest population increases in history. Even American Muslims, that's a tiny little population, 1.1% of the total U.S. population, also show the same trend. Yes, uh, high birth rates, high marriage rates, despite having higher literacy rates. In the next 50 years, the largest community in the world will be Islam. And far surpassing even Christianity, uh, a Muslim child is born every 2.5 seconds. Boom, that's a Muslim child there. MashaAllah. Clearly, we can see that there's something that is saving the Muslim world from falling into the same predicament as Western societies infested by liberal ideologies. And I wonder what that is. That is Islam, Daniel. We are not the same as Americans, as non-Muslims, there is something that is keeping us from uh, going there. That means an empowered Muslim woman is not equal to a feminist or an empowered American woman. How can you make that? Okay, another thing that he makes a very bizarre argument, actually quite typical of you in your article, Muslim uh, Feminism, in order to argue against Muslim uh, education that older women have something that you call lower marriage value. Wow. Because of her spending much of her fertility years seeking an education, so because she has this lower marriage value, she'll be forced to ma marry a man of a lower marriage value as well. Poor them. Firstly, I feel it's straight out of some medieval Hindu uh, Upanishad book. 
literally this idea is very hindu it's very pagan it's un-islamic i don't think you've read even a basic book seriously you can say that you know i'm educated who's your teacher give us a name who is your teacher who's taught you this because i don't think you've even read a basic book of the prophet sira the, the you know the sealed nectar even even children read that the prophet sallallahu a young 25 year old handsome man from a noble family married a 40 year old woman khadija radiallahu who was divorced, widowed twice before. He had six children with her and was Khadija radiallahu an, of lower marriage value, as you say. How dare you say something like that? When she passed away, the Prophet sallallahu married another woman, Sauda radiallahu an. It said in the book, books of Hadith, she was old, she was slow, she was overweight. Is she of uh, you know, lower marriage value, as you say? Um Ayman. Old woman, marrying young man, lower marriage value. Daniel, if you think that these great m women were of low marriage value, as you say, you have no value. You don't even know your history. Muslims should be the last people to talk like this. You take the hadith of Jabir bin Abdullah and then you turn it into something which it's not completely, literally, it's anecdotal advice to a particular Sahabi. And then you say that this is a principle. Brothers and sisters, I want you all to see that just like Christian apologetics, Islamophobes, cherry pick hadith, unfortunately, Daniel does the same thing and creates a narrative out of them. He uses that one single hadith of Jabir bin Abdullah being told by the Prophet Sallallahu that, you know, you, uh, you should have married a younger woman. And then he makes a complete narrative out of this. Are you trying to say that the Prophet Sallallahu actually contradicted what he said? Because if you're trying to say that, that's even more dangerous. Because you're saying the Prophet Sallallahu doesn't do what he say, says. But the essence is that ulama have always understood this, uh, this hadith to be an anecdotal advice for Jabir bin Abdullah. The Prophet married women who were much older and were, in your words, Allahu, but I would, may Allah forgive me for even saying this, of lower marriage value. All right, you talked for seven minutes, so. Really? Okay. You yep. can take an extra one. Six one. So, uh, I mean, I don't know even what to respond to. It's just so funny, uh, for, like saying that there are no women who have found in Madahab or written major tafsir or collected hadith because they weren't doing it for fame. So you're implying that Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa, they were doing it for fame. That's why we know them. That, that was your explanation. So it's kind of uh, really insulting explanation. And I don't think you thought it through. Uh, you mentioned, again, women traveling, like uh, Fatima al-Khair. Uh, but again, you admitted she traveled with her husband, with her father, her wealthy father, who was a diplomat. So yeah, she traveled with her father. That was her wali. It wasn't like she was independently going and searching for hadith and taking uh, chains of transmission or anything like that, like this kind of modern feminist sheikhat study of Islam today. You want to talk about the Muslim world has the highest birth rate? Yeah, I know that. I know that. And I, I cited that. But the, we have to look at trends. The trend is that it's rapidly declining. The birth rates and fertility rate is rapidly I'm citing the UN. I'm citing government. The UAE's government. Are, you disagree with the UAE government about the divorce rate? 62% of marriages are ending within the first four years. And this is mostly the majority is women, empowered women who are breaking up these marriages. This is a trend. So look at the trend line. Yeah, right now the birth rate is high, but as we follow the West into women's empowerment, we follow the West into women's, the, these models of women's education, sending women to the universities to learn liberalism and atheism, uh, that we're going to follow suit. That's the disaster that I'm pointing to. And, and it, you don't seem to get it. You're just making, making pictures of me with tears. <laughs> I don't get it. So then um, lower marriage value, like this is something that is very basic. And I don't know why um, you don't want to understand this. Again, our debate wasn't about marriage it was about education. So you are just gish galloping, trying to find every single article of mine about feminism and argue against it. This is not an organized way to debate. 
Debate means you hear my arguments and you respond to the things that I say, right? You had your opening statement, you could have laid things out, and then you respond to my actual arguments like I'm responding to your actual arguments. So, but if you want to talk about marriage value, and you cited this hadith about uh, from narrated from Jabir ibn Abdullah, and where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam advising and giving nasiha to this Sahabi to marry a virgin, and you're saying that this is just a very specific advice to one particular Sahabi. No, why? why where are you getting that? This is this is actually has been understood by scholars as general advice. And why is it general advice? Because it's human nature. It's human nature. Yeah, there can be many exceptional women who are older, who are not virgins, who would make amazing wives. And this is proven by the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, by some of the, you know, Atika, we mentioned Atika. Uh, she was very valued, even though she was divorced multiple times by uh, the likes of Omar radiallahu anhu or Zubair ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu. So th there's no contradiction between those Sahabiyat being very valuable women and the general advice to marry virgins and to marry young. There's no contradiction in that. And it's in fact, it's human nature. Men have this natural inclination to women who are in a particular age range, a fertility window. All men have this kind of natural uh, default, right? Just like women have the natural default to marry men of higher status. Hypergamy, as I mentioned in the intro, that is something natural for women as well. And Islam doesn't say women should know you should marry the poor men. Poor men are just as good as rich men. Uh, high status men are just as good as low status men. There's no such advice in Islam. In fact, the opposite. In fiqh, if you have studied fiqh, you know about kafa'a, you know about what you know about suitability. Open the bab in the books of fiqh on kafa'a when it comes to nikah, kitab on nikah, and the scholars will mention that women have to be married to suitable men, and one of the suitability factors is status and and wealth. So that kind of natural uh, inclination that women has, the Sharia recognizes it and uh, supports it in the best way. And, and there can be exceptions to wealth. You might have a person who is extremely pious and extremely knowledge, but poor, could still be an excellent husband, right? But all things being equal, if there are two po equally pious, equally uh, wealthy men, uh, no, no, two equally pious, equally knowledgeable men that come to you as a suitor, and you have to choose between them, one is rich, one is poor, you have the right to choose the rich one. In fact, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the more rational choice. Just like if two women come, same level of knowledge, same level of piety, same level of uh, lineage, and be come to, to a man, and one is a virgin and one is not, he, it is actually preferable for him to marry the one who is who is a virgin, all things being equal. So you, you're you just not aware of the basics of fiqh, basically, and you're giving a feminist interpretation to everything. Are you done? Uh, you're done? Yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen first. So... So, I mean, you can respond to the points that I made. Obviously, I do. I always do. You haven't yet, so. Just a minute. I always do. No, you're lying. Okay. So, uh, you said, uh, let's start with the last one. You said uh, that it's preferable. It's in our nature to marry uh, younger uh, men or successful men and this and that. Actually, uh, before you mentioned fiqh, let me remind you, Daniel, my dear brother Daniel, before a scholar's opinion comes the Prophet's opinion. First, we see what the Prophet ﷺ said. And the Prophet ﷺ said that if you have to marry, you choose the one with the good akhlaq. There are four things that you look for marriage. There's akhlaq, there's wealth, there's beauty, and then there's lineage. Of all of these things, prioritize akhlaq. What does that mean? We, do, we are an Akira-based religion. We have to fight our low natural desires to marry maybe a nice-looking person or whatever. So there's no preference here. 
here. If you want to be a true Muslim, go with the Hadith, right? So you talk about uh, the trends going down, fertility rates going down, and that's absolutely wrong. You're lying to your audience that you always do. I'm sorry to say, but that's the truth. Uh, this is by UN Statistics. Uh, 2050, just in the next few decades, we are going to be the highest uh, uh, population, the largest population in the world, far surpassing Christianity. And that's what it S uh, says these are statistics these are people who know what these things you say if you state uae for divorce who takes uae as an example firstly they don't have high literacy rates we know that they they they're not like turkey they're not like algeria with the scientific education and when uh, does it mean i mean divorce rates if you're going to say divorce rates means like women are empowered or they're going uh, they're becoming feminist we know that the sahaba got divorced there were as many divorces as marriages as you uh, we could say literally that because everybody who's married was previously divorced so divorce doesn't count and then on top of that what else did you say Ah, I talked about marriage value because that's what you say. You always get the marriage question somehow into education. And that's why I had to mention that I'm sticking to the debate. Now, I want to say one thing. I want to make it very sure, uh, clear that I prove that Daniel Hakikaju has no clue whatsoever of what feminism is. And I want to prove that it's going to be really fun. Okay, in this article, he says... Um, I mean, he has a perverted, deficient, severely compromised understanding of Islam. And I'm going to prove uh, that. He says in his article, this, this, this one, one of the main examples. OK, hold on. Let me go there. This is what he says. One of the main examples always used to show that pre-Islamic Arabs were anti-woman. Uh, as if he doesn't think that they were anti-woman. Were they pro-women? Like, uh, were they like matriarchal? Uh, that's what you're trying to say. And that Islam liberated women. He doesn't think that Islam liberated women. Can you believe that? Is the practice of burying infant daughters in Jahiliya. So 1400 years of Islamic scholarship was wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Daniel, with no Islamic education, he keeps saying, I say ISIS and this and that. Prove to us who is your sheikh, other than the guy that I mentioned who has links with ISIS. Prove to us. No Islamic education, no Arabic education. He's got it right. That's what he's saying. So 1400 years ago. So he says, Allah, of course, condemns the practice of burying infant daughters. He says this. But when we read the tafsirs, he says, of these ayat, we find that there are two huge misinterpretations of this practice being spread nowadays. Tafsirs, okay. He wants to go the tafsir way. Let's go to the tafsir way. The motive, he says, this, uh, this is the second major in misinterpretation, he, uh, was pointed out to, be, uh, to me by one of my teachers. I'd really like to know who this teacher was, Daniel. Was it the Saifuddin guy who has links with this guy who planned 9-11? <laughs> so bearing daughters was not due to, and I can prove that, please. Simpli it was. You say that it wasn't due to a simplistic hatred of women. No, they loved women. That's why they buried them. This is actually a feminist projection onto pre-Islamic Arabs. Now, now, lo and behold, everybody, let's check one of the most popular tafsirs in Islam, Tafsir Ibn Kathir. He comments in the same ayah that the people of pre-Islamic times of ignorance would bury their daughters due to their hatred of girls. Is this a feminist projection? Was Ibn Kathir, a 14th century scholar, a feminist Daniel? And then he keeps saying this again. This is Ibn Kathir, the idolaters abhorrence for daughters. Daniel again and again makes these statements. I want to talk about this. He says, he mentions in one of his videos that how, you know, feminists have a problem with, uh, what do you call it, uh, gender uh, inclusive language. Like they want gender, gender inclusive language. It's a video where he talks about like feminists have a problem with why is God he and all of that. So basically that's called the gender, the gender neutral uh, language. And here we have the Prophet's wife, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu anha, who asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why aren't why we women are not mentioned in the Quran as the men are mentioned by the way for those of you who don't know Arabic the word uh, uh, you know mu'minun or muslimun always mentions 
women implicitly because this uh, means that you know uh, it, it's a plural pro, uh, noun but it has an implicit implication for women as well but she wanted something which is direct so that's what she asked the prophet sallallahu gets what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also appreciated her concern for gender inclusive language because this wasn't out of you know i want to compete with you in dunya no i want to compete with you for the love of Allah, I want my Lord, who I love, to be, you know, to refer to me directly. So, is is Um Salama, Um Al Mu'minin, Um Salama, a feminist, Daniel? Am I done? Yes. Yeah, you again went over. So, I mean, this is so outrageous. <laughs> like you insist on making the same kind of lies. The same kind of evil claims that I'm connected with people who plan 9-11. Like, don't you like have any shame? Like, don't you fear Allah? Like, I'm just shocked by the kind of hatred that you express. And there are many scholars actually that endorse me and share my stuff. And you want to see that? Go to my YouTube channel, go to my Facebook, go to the interviews that I've done with many scholars. So, I mean, it's just shocking that your kind of behavior but i guess you're desperate uh so un stats that muslims will be the largest religious group again so what that's because of the trend that or the uh, fertility rate now but that fertility rate is dropping again you don't seem to understand statistics and how math works i'm surprised that you have a, a, a stem background understand statistics you can understand that you can still be the largest group by 2050 and that still be a result upping fertility rate the basic mathematics you don't even need a st statistic degree to understand this but it's not that difficult the fertility rate is dropping very fast marriage rates are dropping fast the average size in certain countries the for the uh, average household size was you know over 10 people are having couples are having eight nine ten children and they're with their extended families uh but because of westernization feminization liberalization the education of women now women are not getting married until they are in their late 20s and 30s this is not american stats this is not u.s stats this is muslim world stats so the families are getting smaller and smaller what this is a huge problem and and you don't want to acknowledge it um you mentioned that uae has uae has no literacy i mean that's kind of a harsh thing to say about a muslim country in fact i cited that they have the highest rate of women in stem in science and technology 40 percent so you're calling them illiterate um you know you said that uh again you go to my articles like if you want to just do a review of my articles that's that's great that's not what this debate is about i think that my articles stand for themselves so i've actually linked in the video description all of the art my articles that you're citing and you're attributing to terrorist groups or terrorist teachers i've cited them because i'm not embarrassed by the articles there's nothing wrong in those articles if you were uh, a serious person you, you and the people who are helping you write your spiel or whatever would have written an actual public response but they can't do that because it would be embarrassing for them to do it so they have to uh, resort to name calling and calling me isis and so forth so will you keep mentioning liberation like women's liberation is something that all scholars recognize where show me a citation Show me a citation about, first of all, translate Islamic women's liberation. Translate in, in, into Arabic. You know Arabic so, so well, apparently, or at least you're giving that impression and you're saying, I don't know what Arabic means or, or what Arabic is. Give me the uh, term for feminism or Islamic liberation, Islamic women's liberation. I want to know the word for it and I want to know where in a pre-modern scholarly work we can find women's liberation as a value empowerment as a value give me the arabic word for empowerment women's empowerment 
and show me where in a classical work, pre-modern text, that female empowerment and female liberation is found. I, I really would like to know that. Maybe you can educate me on this. And yeah, again, like you want to keep slandering me about being uh, affiliated with terrorist groups. I've denounced all terrorist groups. I've denounced. Um, it looks like Sophia is yeah. back. Yes, thank you. Can I start? Uh, I'm sorry for the so let's see break. Can you hear me? Do you just come back? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank so, you. Yeah. So I all that's left is a three minute closing. I already gave some remarks, so you can close and I, then I'll. No, no, uh, I just want to take a bit of uh, your time, just a little bit, and then I'll go to. Because, you know. Is this a closing? What is this? Because no, we've uh, had the four rounds? No, 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 it's not the closing. You want to have open discussion? Uh, no. Uh, just this one last uh, round. We've had our four rounds. I mean, we, we it's had, already been four rounds. No, we had an extra uh, half an hour, right? Right. So let's do that at least. Uh, we can, you know, it could be an. Uh, it, this is also an open discussion. So let me start. Let me not waste your time. But cool. I, I don't want. I don't need to see more of my website and you like making memes about me. Like, no, give me an actual. I'm, we can have open discussion. You see, I'm. Yeah, it is an open discussion, but I have okay, to. Open discussion. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean. Uh, yeah, I didn't show your screen. Yes, but I have to discuss this because now that we are closing, so I really want everyone to understand. See where I'm coming from. I don't speak unfounded things, and I did study literally uh, Daniel for a year. And I did all the time, you know, literally, uh, actually want to give him the benefit of doubt that maybe I understood him wrong. Maybe I didn't get this point. Maybe I didn't. But then this, you know, after one year, I could say that, you know, OK, this is very extreme. And when I talk about ISIS, uh, I have proof to say <laughs> to prove my claims. Maybe I could do it some other time because that's not the topic. Uh, but maybe another time. I, I don't speak. These are not just, you know, what so you, you studied Islam for one year. You studied Islam for one year. Not, is that what you said? not Islam. You, Daniel, <laughs> your content. You studied me for one year. Yes. <laughs> so okay. you can. Yeah. Anyways, uh, uh, this last point that I really want to make, which is a very important one, which is that, uh, OK, I understand those of you who like him do so because he comes across as this defender of Islam against liberalism. So in my study of Daniel's content, I thought, OK, his understanding of feminism I've shown in my talk. I can go back to the points also he mentioned, like, for example, the fertility. I mean, he's uh, uh, preferring numbers or quantity to quality when the Prophet ﷺ said that there would be a time where you would be numerous, but you wouldn't have the uh, spiritual uh, you know, weight. And that's because of the fitna. True. That's not really because of what he thinks it is. And then he talks about uh, what else? Uh, maybe a p public uh, sort of uh, an appraisal of his work. Well, this is public enough, isn't it? And then he talks about something else as well. I've, I've mentioned about the women's empowerment. Now, I, <laughs> things are not the same. <laughs> you know, women's empowerment, I mentioned about these, this movement, literally, of female scholarship, unprecedented in history, from the 8th uh, century till the 15th century, where there were women scholars throughout the Muslim world. No civilization before that. I hope you all well, hear I me haven't that. denied. I haven't uh, denied yeah, that there are women me, scholars. Let me, let, you let me, said open discussion. Uh, no, no, no. So I, you I said women this. scholars. This I, is open discussion. So no, no. you said women scholars. You said women scholars in every point of Muslim history. I didn't deny that. I said, show me that they were more than just like 1% of overall scholars or 2% of overall scholars. You cannot. That's what I want to see. Okay, hold on. I'm going to get to that point because this is really important. So what yeah, we're I waiting. Mean, we're waiting. Yes, yes, yes. So in my study of Daniel's content, I said, okay, his understanding of feminism is all messed up. Yes, it is. But it's diagnosis plus his understanding of Islam is also messed up, to say the least. So maybe we can agree on the solution. I really wanted to agree on the solution. Wallahi, I did. Just maybe. To my shock, what did I find? Oh my God, you would be shocked as well. That Daniel is a men's rights activist. 
He calls he became famous as the defender of Islam against kafir liberal ideologies like feminism and well he subscribes to another western kafir ideology known as the men's rights movement so feminism is a women's rights movement and men's rights is the male version of feminism they're both western the typical kafir unbalanced mentality they have nothing whatsoever to do with islam western history is rid riddled with these extreme dialectical partisan movements church versus state capitalism versus communism right versus left rep republican versus democrat and feminism versus men's rights i was shocked can you believe it islam on the other hand is the balanced middle we we don't have no men's rights and women's rights feminism versus red pill we have men and women together as awliya wal mu'minuna wal mu'minati awliya ba'duhum awliya so, so you found, hold on hold on hold on so, this so you is, found this my fun. secret membership oh, yes. you found my secret I membership think... in the men's rights movement oh no i've been exposed <laughs> it's this exposed point, oh there, there, DH, is no. there is more i was shocked. it's the end you ended my career i you have ended my career. i literally oh my god and then on top of that daniel recommends a disgusting obscene movie that's filled with fahisha to his followers to indoctrinate them into this kafir western ideology the most disturbing part was seriously wallahi i say to all of you that daniel uses the same arguments and the cheap decontextualized wordplay that muslim feminists like amina wadud fatima nisi zena and were used to ju justify feminism exactly the same argument you see they say oh, feminism is in islam this right is <laughs> now the best part is the leaders of this movement are like serious rape apologists and domestic oh. violence advocates can you believe that i mean that explains why he talks like this i mean i have never he says that i've been you know i talk to these scholars and this and that i've read everything that is to be read on uh, you know uh, islam in on english websites and urdu that's well, what i have access to nobody writes this rubbish literally you are a rape apologist uh, daniel and you have to agree what's worse is that for all of you people you would be sure I'm a rape I'm a rapist apologist I'm a rape apologist you're not a rapist come I'm, it. you're not I'm, a rapist I can I'm <laughs> I'm a rape apologist I'm a rape apologist because I'm you think I'm a member of this organization no 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 uh, no, no. and the, a mem and uh, people in this organization are rape apologists no, therefore i'm a rape apologist no 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 what's the logic explain it to me I'm going explain to the logic please. yes the uh, well, logic is we're waiting yalla yes everyone can go to your website and they can check just type in search rape the articles that come across you're like you're actually arguing the way they argue that not all you know it's an equal match not all of the victims rape victims are women it's an equal match and that is and most of the you have no, the audacity where show me you show me the, where yes i will post that you have the audacity show, no right now show me i didn't put show that me. on the this um on my why not that's I the main that's the crux of your claim no that's so not I, i'm a rape I, apologist yeah i'm a rape apologist because i say that men and women are raped at equal Rates? No, no. That's, the, Th that's not what? all you how say. How am I ra how am I how am I rape apologist? Hold on, hold on. You say Show me. that most of the cases uh rape uh, cases are not true. That's the same argument that these crazy men use. And by the way, this is a neo conservative movement. Show it. Show it. Yes, I will. Show it. Inshallah, I will. Neo conservative movement. For those of you who don't know, do you know who these neo conservatives are? For those of you, these are the bloodthirsty people who killed. You can see he. These are the bloodthirsty people who killed millions of Muslims in uh, Iraq, in uh, uh, Afghanistan, in Pakistan during these uh, war. You know, war on Islam, and they have their blood. soaked hands even on our innocent palestinian brothers and sisters he wants to join he wants us to join this oppressive kafir movement do you know what uh you know wh what uh, justification he gives uh, for us to join this men's rights movement he says that red pill is just common sense patriarchy oh my slides Are you yeah, sharing you your slides? Yeah, we've we've seen enough of your slides. Oh, so no. here are the statistics on false rape accusations. This is what I cite uh in that paper. So depending on the study, they're they're saying that there are 
you know, 1.5% of rape accusations are false. Uh, the, According in, to in Harris and Grace, 1999. This is the US. 10.9%. 10. Who cares 10. about 10.9%. Who cares about these kufar? <laughs> Obviously, they lie. Oh, oh you don't care? You don't care if uh, non Muslim women are raped? We're talking about Muslims. I'm, I don't care, <laughs> you don't care, care about you don't, them. You said, who cares about, about kufar? Do you, you don't care if uh, non Muslim women who, get raped? I mean, who cares about <laughs> kufar statistics? 90%, Let's 47%. Talk about Let's talk about the rapes in No, you're called me, you, you called me you called me a rape apologist yes, for are. citing I'm these sure. studies, for citing these studies. This is US. How many of these rape cases How, who are said, Where does it say US? Where does it say US? Yeah, this is New York. This is look at that. Where? Are they talking about Afghanistan? Are they talking where? about rapes in Indonesia? Just go Where does it say U.S.? Okay, anyways. This is from the U.S. Department of Justice. What Let about me, these other studies? Okay, now... Okay. These are general studies okay, about the... Let's talk about patriarchy. ...prevalence of false rape accusation. Sure, like, sure. you're just outraged. You're ridiculous. Uh, yeah, you, it's equally as you, then. Uh, let's no, talk about equally patriarchy. equally as you, then. P patriarchy, then. Let's talk about... Uh, let me share my screen. Come on. Let me share my screen. Come on. Come on, where is this going? Like, this is just we're, we're silly ending. at this point. It's embarrassing. Uh, for you, I'm sure. I know nobody would have told you all of this, isn't it? So he says this is how he justifies this. That's the best part. Just like a Muslim feminist justifies feminism in Islam. And, you know, it's ridiculous when you put like a Western ideology into Islam. He says patriarchy is kawama. And he uses the word uh, which is in 434. But this is absolute nonsense because patriarchy existed in, uh, patriarchy still exists in Hindu societies. They burn their women. It exists in Jewish societies. Women are like subhuman. Yeah. They can't even enter. Yeah. So are you calling they have fasting. That? They have fasting you, and prayer in calling? other religions too. And yeah. Islam. That means Islam is promoting paganism. Like, no. What's your point? Yeah, no, all no. societies are patriarchal. What all I'm religions saying, are patriarchal. No, you're so wrong. What? No, uh, right now. Which we which saw, which listen, religion listen, is not patriarchal? Listen, which religion is not patriarchal? Listen, what I'm saying. Which religion is not patriarchal? We have kawama. We don't have patriarchy. Kawama is not patriarchy. Just like uh, jihad is not holy war. That's the difference. We have kawama, and kawama is different. Patriarchy is different. Pag patriarchy existed in pagan Arabia. You want to get, get paganism back? That's what it was all about. Women were hated. Women. That was a male chauvinistic, misogynistic can, can, society. Can, men, can, can women be um, the sultan in Islam according to the Sharia? No. But it's not that's because... That's patriarchy. That's so not only, only, men, only, men, only no. men can be the khalifa? Only men can be the sultan? Only me who is the head of the household in uh, in a marriage? Listen, listen. According to Islam, who is it? Is it a man or a woman, or is it equal? Listen. Who is the head of a household? Who is the head of a household in marriage? I'm going to talk to according you. According to Islam, this. answer. Why can't yeah. you answer the question? Yeah, I will. I've answered all your questions. So this is that's patriarchy. That. No, listen. Islam, that is, that Islam is not puts patriarchy. men. That, then you have to say. <laughs> then you'll have to. Where is your definition of patriarchy? Yeah. We have to Where look at the definition get, of patriarchy too. It, because are you c comparing Islam with Judaism then? Are you c comparing Islam with Hinduism then? They burn, because of their per patriarchy, they burn their women whenever uh, a, a woman's husband dies. Or for example, uh, the Christians consider a woman the source of all evil. Is that then you have to say, oh my God, this. But the thing is, Kawama, you have misdefined Kawama. Kawama is not patriarchy. Our women, uh, our men are our protectors, our maintainers. And we Muslim women reciprocate this with our loving obedience. Kawama is no slave master relationship. Allah says, Al mu'minuna wal mu'minati ba'duhum awliya ubad. We are awliya. There's no, uh, you know, tug of war. Who's going to be the leader? Because we don't compete in leadership. We don't compete in the dunya. Who cares about who's the leader? We care about who's going to get the hereafter. Actually, even within men, they shouldn't compete within the leadership because it's, uh, a, a, you know, somebody who yearns for leadership should never become the leader. That's how Islam works. What are you talking about? This doesn't make sense. So, you know. Islam doesn't care about the leader? No, I said we as no. Muslims. 
We should. We as Muslims don't aspire. care about the leader. No, we shouldn't aspire to be leaders. We should aspire to be uh, to earn the hereafter. But how, I want to. I want to. You, no, you've, you've been going on and on. So let me give a response. Sure. You can't just keep talking. This is not your lecture hour. Mm -hmm. So this, I brought up the definition of patriarchy from Merriam-Webster dictionary: a social organization marked by the supremacy of the father in the clan or family, and the legal dependence of wives and children and the reckoning of descent and inheritance in the male line. So this I'm, is I'm this is patriarchy. Islam is patriarchy. We don't we Islam, don't care yeah, about I gave you the Merriam Quran. Webster. We care about the Quran. The Quran says Qawwama, just like the Quran says Jihad. Now, Merriam-Webster would uh, define Jihad as holy war, um, you know, uh, conducted by Muslims. That's wrong. Rubbish. Jihad you said, is not holy you said war. Islam, you said Islam doesn't have patriarchy. So we have yes. to look at what the word patriarchy it's, means. No, Islam has Qawwama. We <laughs> have to look at the word what Kawama means, uh, Daniel, you are doing the opposite thing. What does Kawama mean? What is patriarchy? I asked you, I asked you, okay, what's the definition of patriarchy? What's, the, the, what's the definition of patriarchy? What's the definition of patriarchy? What, you, you tell me, wh how is the Hindu society patriarchal? Tell me, what's the difference between... Give me a definition, yeah. give me a definition of patriarchy. Tell me why pagan Arabs, you have a slide. what's the difference? You prepared a whole slide Go with on, the now, word patriarch share. in it. What is the definition of patriarchy? We don't care about what patriarchy means. Okay, do, this do is, we, I care about what Kawama It's on your means. slide. Yeah. It's on your slide. Because so that's what I If I'm you saying. don't get define it, if you don't define it, how can you say it's not equal to Kawama? That is so, uh, I must say, I thought I was actually debating a Harvard graduate. Are you a graduate? Yeah. So that's really funny because we are talking about Kawama. And we all we need to do is what is Kawama? All we need that, and this is a you know terrible thing that Daniel also does, which I really wanted to bring to his attention. Maybe he does it unintentionally. Maybe, uh, maybe he needs to correct it. He actually slanders Umar radiallahu an, a Sahabi, one of the best. He says in his uh, article, uh, it's okay to ban Muslim women from. Masajid, uh, that the fact that Umar radiallahu an issued a verdict banning women from the mosque in his time and the companions accepted this. This is absolute slander because the Umar radiallahu an, uh, Umar radiallahu an ruled for 10 years. Are you trying to say that he didn't allow women to enter into the masjid? Here is the actual, um, you know, quotation. I mean, this is where you're you either you're dishonest or you're ignorant it can just be two one of these two seriously so these women you know how umar radiallahu wa, wa, was these women were young women they were just loitering talking because you can't just you know gossip in a masjid you have to pray and you have to do something religious that's who he said and he prevented them he threw them out literally from the masjid it didn't mean that he banned women from the masjid the your slandering a Sahabi, D Daniel, your work is either based on your ignorance or, I don't know, literally, I don't know, or an agenda, I have no idea, men's rights agenda or something. So that's, uh, I'm going to end. Uh, and I have my statement ready, my concluding remarks, but I've <laughs> proved sufficiently that he lies about statistics. He lies about Islam. He doesn't understand feminism. Anybody who disagrees with him is a feminist. I am a feminist, according to him, just because I disagree with him. Even if I say I hate and I, you know, feminism is a dangerous ideology, I am the opposite of feminism because I took a completely different route. It doesn't matter. Just because I, Ibn Kathir, according to him, is a feminist. Uh, um, 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 uh, um Salama is a feminist. So I'm going to conclude. I'm going to give you my concluding remarks now. Thank you very much. Okay, now a little bit of, you know, enough of Daniel. Now we need to think about the Ummah. We are all Muslims here and we all have a responsibility towards ourselves. Our families never, ever, ever think that a Muslim woman would uh, prioritize an actual Muslim woman would prioritize her um, work, her career for her family. And I've actually proved that much of the Muslim population doesn't have the liberty to do so. We don't have the liberty to be like, you know what, I really want to make my career because times are tough. We are in a state of crisis. So brothers and sisters, 
We are all the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi The knowledge of this deen is his inheritance to us. We have a duty to protect and share this inheritance. Deen is education. We are a tradition where a religious scholar like Abu Hanifa wrote an extensive treatise uh, on mathematics. We are a tradition where a pioneering uh, physician like Ibn Nafis was also a Shafi jurist. A tradition where a female scholar like Umm Hani raised four of her sons to become scholars of the four Sunni schools. She was herself a scholar and she had four sons in Sunni schools, scholars. We are a tradition where young female scholar Fatima bin Saad al Khair traveled three continents to seek knowledge. Brothers and sisters, you belong to a tradition where men and women together Yes, together. Uh, and I've cited enough works. I've cited our classical uh, texts. You can go and read our classical texts to see this. It's not that I haven't cited anything. He lies again regarding that. Together we created science and technology just to serve the cause of Islam. We all have a duty to resurrect the tradition. Just like the Sahaba and the Sahabi had built the foundations of the Islamic civilization, cooperating with each other as awliya, wal mu'minuna wal mu'minati, ba'duhum awliya ba'd, cooperating with, with each other in the market, in the masjid, and in the home. It's a complete lie, my brother Daniel actually says, Shifa bint Abdullah was no, uh, you, know, uh, you know, she wasn't over uh, Muslim women, like in charge over Muslim women. That was another woman. That was, a sh what was her name? Uh, Suja or something. Shifa bint Abdullah was on economics. She was a chief security officer. This is written in the Hadith. She had to check the uh, quality What's of the staff. Wording? What's the wording? What is the Arabic muhasiba, word for chief? Muhasiba. <laughs> muhasiba. Muhasiba. Hisba. Do you, what's Hisba? <laughs> Hisba, what do you mean by what's Hisba? The, uh, the actual job profile is written in the same uh, article. I what mean, is Muhasaba? What is it? Muhasaba actually hisba? means to, uh, you know, to uh, surveillance, basically. You go Which, and check. <laughs> not on the wo women. Hisba. Women. I'm sorry, not on the women. She used to check the quality of the goods. It was a market. Okay. What are women? You're, you're actually mm. arguing that there weren't no women. And they, in, only in the dark, they used to go to the masjid. So why would she be uh, looking for women in the market? You don't make sense. So anyone now in the market, in the masjid and in the home, this cooperation, anyone who tells you, brothers and sisters, this is not your place, silence them with your tradition. Anyone who tells you, you can't do this, silence them with your efforts. We are Muslim women. Are you listening, Daniel? Muslim women and men. Our time has barakah. Our efforts have impact. And, uh, you know, you keep saying this. You can either be one or either or. That's your Western lens. That's that colonialist smokescreen. These women were all great mothers, great wives, and all of these scholars and all. Now, yes, we are inundated with tribulations and misguidance. There's no doubt about that. As this is the end of times, what do you expect? I want to leave you with two solutions. I don't want to leave you without solutions. Two solutions. Obviously, Daniel's solution is that women should be kept out of, uh, you know, every place <laughs> except for the kitchen. Well, we are in the kitchen as well as every other place, if you like it or you don't. But my solutions are this. And these are tried and tested. These are not my solutions. Tried and tested by our predecessors. One, hyper dawa. I'm going to call it hyper dawa. Remember that word. All of us, Muslim men and women, literally need to become dawa machines, learning, practicing, and sharing our deen. Solution number two, we need to revive our tradition of the masjid being the center of learning. The great Islamic universities, Qairawiyin, Al-Azhar, Nizamiya, Zaytuna, the old one, uh, were all extended masajid. Uh, uh, our bro brother Daniel says, where are the statistics of women entering madrasas? I've actually quoted so many times and I've actually told him that women were teaching 
in these institutions. And these universities were actually extended masajids, where religious as well as secular sciences, that's where we differ from the West. We don't have the, this, this dichotomy, this uh, you know, difference. Religious as well as secular sciences were studied, fiqh with medicine, hadith with physics. But we can only get to that stage when we have enough educated and devoted men and women who will establish something as extraordinary as this. We need to teach the world what ethical economics means, brothers and sisters. We need to teach the this world is, what bioethics means. This bio is going a little mean. bit too long. We need to teach. Wrap it up. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. We need to, to uh, teach the world what social egalitarianism means. We need to teach the world how the pursuit of science enhances faith. It does not obliterate it. That's what the West says, right? Brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with a reminder. We as Muslims <laughs> changed the world before. We have the power to change the world right now. Jazakumullah. Okay, so, Assalamu